Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Road to World Football Show. I am Patrick Darty, back from uh, paternity leave, which was like two days. Joined by <laughs> Denny Carter. Yeah, my, you might think it's bad that I didn't really take any paternity leave. I mean, I am taking. I'm doing a lot less work than usual this week. But you know, my wife already basically is begging me, "Go podcast, please." <laughs> leave me just do something go podcast uh, she, as, as she told you if i'm if I, I think i'm quoting her directly this isn't sweden go do your job yeah, yeah this is not sweden this is not the nordic countries you've got some work to do you've got some podcasts to make with denny carter and please for the love of god stop acting like you're the only one who didn't get any sleep <laughs> uh, men, men are babies about yeah, that though it's bad. i mean we are we are just enormous babies when it comes if we if i don't get like exactly seven hours of sleep it's it's as if i haven't slept in a week you know yes. and and my wife my wife can be woken up by the kids like four times in a night and be fine the next day and not not complain at all and meanwhile i'm like lying on the couch like begging people to leave me alone we're the exact opposite in normal times where she's the one who's got to get her exact right amount of sleep and i <laughs> Can, uh, I can quote function on like six hours, which I'm sure I, I'm actually just super cranky all day, probably. But right, the roles have been reversed right now, and I'm the one melting down. And, uh, <laughs> it really uh, does. It really does uh, vary from person to person about how how much sleep is necessary. Because I know I've had experience with tough guys on Twitter who say four hours is good i'm good on four hours well grind set four hours is too much like you're just you enjoy being poor if you're sleeping right, four my... hours a night i mean you gotta get that down to one and a half bro um, right i mean you gotta wake up with the uh you know f foreign stock markets opening i get it but uh but yeah yeah and then other people like me are say i need seven hours period six hours and 50 minutes that won't do that won't do i mean everyone the dream is always eight seven and a half is more realistic seven is what i usually end up at i mean seven and a half try to really try to get that seven and a half that seems to be the the sweet spot for me yep. uh, but denny speaking of sweet spots uh, <laughs> <laughs> you hit you found it with your two three-year-old tweet five -year -old. Um, five-year-old tweet tell us about why did aj brown uh retweet he didn't so much retweet you is he anonymously yeah. quoted you but it was an end joke to people in the know, uh, AJ Brown has made you a legend. Just, I'll just give you the floor to explain what has happened. Right. So actually, my interns are telling me that this August, that tweet will be six years old. So it was it was a while ago. Um, and basically, I laid out what amounts to a rubric for positional tweeting in the NFL, where you know a quarterback tweets this way, a running back does that, tight ends do that, and then wide receiver is the is the punchline, which is. Uh, the enemy speaks kindly and holds a knife. And this uh, this is this was created uh, by my internet addled brain because I had seen you know guys like Michael Thomas, Odell, Odell Beckham, Steve Smith uh, tweet you know through contract disputes, through fights with teammates, fights with coaches, ownership, and in a in a very cryptic way. And it struck me that receivers really did tweet a certain way, right? And they, they say the palace is full of gold, but when you open the door, all you see is thieves. Yeah, that, right. And it's like, okay, like Brandon Cooks didn't get his extension, apparently. <laughs> um, but but yeah, so so actually, uh, yeah, so I'm I'm blocked by AJ Brown on, on, on Twitter. I'm I'm not blocked by by many players. I'm uh, blocked by Michael Thomas, actually. So no. that's kind of funny, yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, two two of the more cryptic guys, but uh, it's because I I I tweeted at AJ Brown during his contract negotiations, I think last year or maybe two years ago. Uh, that 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 tweet, my my so-called famous tweet. He didn't like it, so he blocked. He blocked me, and since then, yeah, that's and, how I use the app. That's that is how I use the app. So, right, and as you can hear, fair. my dog, my dog is very upset about this, as you can hear in the background. But uh, um, and and since then, he's been inundated with my tweet by other people. Uh, he would have to block the entire internet in, in order not to see my tweet. So then he just goes out on what's today, Monday, so Sunday night, and he says he in in quotes, "The enemy speaks kindly and holds a knife." <laughs> and my Twitter mentions have been on fire hellishly on fire since then thank you aj brown your life will never be the same i feel like i mean it is it is like kind of a before and after moment for your life that the best tweet of your life made it to like 
the single perfect like realization of your tweet. I mean, yeah. AJ Brown, this is how he wakes up and tweets. I mean, he seems to be a nice guy, but this is how he wakes up and tweets. I, 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 so I, I do. So I see the daggers are long today. <laughs> he just comes down for breakfast and he says yeah. he says uh by you know good morning everybody the enemy speaks kindly and holds a knife yeah. <laughs> and and uh uh i i will say that uh the the simulation theory does strike me as 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 more realistic at this point Game after team. after aj brown uh posted uh posted that and and i had you know lots of uh lots of folks pointing it out to me this morning i i appreciate that uh, and uh, we'll we'll see where it goes from here. But awful announcing the the, the website did a did a story on it on AJ Brown tweeting or tweeting my thing is crazy. Yeah, I, I would say we be simulating Denny the fact that this has made it. I mean, I seriously did almost faint when because I mean, even though I'm not, I mean, just my like re- relation to you. I mean, I have people. I am inundated with people sending me the tweet. It's like I know like the guy whose like album suddenly went number one. <laughs> And like everyone's texting me, see what see what happened, right. Denny. And uh, like I seriously about fainted the first time I saw it. And I, I, I like they took it pains to do it was a it, it was an exact copy paste. He didn't change any of the wording or anything. It was a direct homage to you. Like he he wanted to get it right. He did a direct homage. It, it was it was a copy and paste because um it, it had the what do you call it the ampersand the something? ampersand instead of the word and yeah and, and one of your latest habits to, using the ampersand. You know why I had to do that, Pat? Is because back in the day, posters had to abide by a very uh, what was the limit? What was the real posters knew that it's one hundred and forty characters. It's one forty. The the kids they they don't know. They don't know, and they're spoiled. And yeah. you you had to get creative, and you had to use all sorts of different shortcuts. You couldn't post five hundred words in a tweet like you can today. Okay, that's laziness. Yeah, and so, a so era yeah, of I, runaway character. I had to get it done. I had to have. I had to list every major position on offense and their rubric tweets with with the with the strict character limit. So it, it makes it even better, I think. Yeah, he's been speaking kindly and holding a knife a lot with Juju Smith-Schuster this offseason, oh, by the way. Man. That's been one of the better Twitter storylines of this young offseason. But, so yeah, just congratulations on – it, it is all downhill from here, though, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm just – do I get paid for this? Is this, is this uh, something – Well, is, is, AJ, is AJ Brown going to give me money? Someone did tweet at me. The lawyers just got a lot more expensive since you're now more famous. <laughs> you're more, you have more clout. Your head growing ever mm-hmm. larger. Um, so yeah, right. NBC, NBC is planning. We're planning an increase in our legal bills. So um, we're taking it out of your salary. Actually, there, ha- there, there has been an NBC truck parked outside of my house all morning. So I am wondering what's going on. Yeah, we're taking it out of your salary. We are not increasing your salary. Ah uh, well, nevertheless. Never. The less we will move on to. Uh, by the way, I, why are we blocked by this? I think because you know, like we're like sarcastic a lot on, online, but like I, I don't ever like tweet at athletes, obviously, and I've no. never been able to figure out why I'm blocked by Michael Thomas. The closest I can get is I do. Uh, I may have a lot of negative tweets about Ohio State, <laughs> and I think maybe one of them there probably go. got retweeted into Michael Thomas's timeline. And I, my theory has always been some of my Ohio State hate. When I <laughs> that that could be it. I mean, let's let's be honest about it. Michael Thomas is severely online. He's severely online. I mean, dog levels have I mean, they've almost poisoned him several times. Dog yeah, right, levels right. are so high. But what is the deal with Ohio State? You can go anywhere in America. It doesn't matter. A city of any size. And on like fall Saturdays, there are people driving around with like Ohio State flags in their truck bed. I've never seen yeah. a fan base quite like Ohio State. In in Maryland, where you know our team is in the Big Ten with Ohio State, we're supposedly rivals or whatever. It's not yeah. true, but uh, uh, yeah, you see Ohio State fans everywhere. I'm like, how's this possible? When they when you graduate from the Ohio State University, <clears throat> they give you a truck bed flag. And like a bucket filled with cement that you put the flag in. Yeah. And like things to secure the bucket in the back of your truck. So you can like take corners going 40 miles an hour in a 25 on Saturday afternoons in college football to announce <laughs> that you've gone to Ohio State. The analytics say there are more Ohio State flags in America than American flags. There are. It's actually a problem. Um, we need to. <laughs> uh, my local courthouse recently took down the American flag and put up an Ohio State flag. Of course, you don't see anything about that in the, the culture war coverage. No, nope. I haven't seen CNN cover that. <clears throat> There's not just a Buckeye flying over my downtown. And I live in St. Charles, Missouri. So uh, 
uh, yeah, I would like to see CNN. I would like to see the media get on this. So anyway. you would probably like to see the football media get on talking about football. Yeah, probably. You know, average podcast listener. Uh, we're here. Yeah, I didn't do a ton of prep. I got that kid. <laughs> uh, one of four. Yeah, yeah, one of four. I swear to God, not a crazy person. Uh, <laughs> we just like kids, apparently. Uh, you have lots of labor for the farm. We, we do. Yes, uh, we we can now. Thankfully, we can finally plant turnips now. Uh, we have <laughs> Thank a God. Pair, a fourth pair of little hands. I'm coming over. Yeah, they're going to tend the garden. But ESPN's Adam Schefter reports the Bears are, quote, leaning toward trading the first overall pick in the 2023 NFL draft, thereby locking in Justin Fields as the starter. I mean, this is not the final word. It's only February 27th. We have two months of draft rumors to go. This kind of always seemed like the most likely outcome, though, did it not? Like, I think even if the Bears in their heart of hearts want to trade Justin Fields, I thought they would always just find the proposition untenable to like, tell the Bears fan base, hey, I know we've been trying to find a quarterback for 40 years, and we finally got one that's kind of exciting, but we're going to trade him. Yeah. Um, it, no, it would be. A, reason I, yeah, so tell me, yeah. this kind of seems like the most likely outcome, correct? Right. I mean, it would have been a huge upset if Schefter or somebody else on the national scene had reported the bears are keeping the number one pick and like, it's not, it's not for sale. Then, you know, you know, you like that, that would be like a clear signal that they would, they would be done with fields that the year after he almost broke the single season QB rushing record. Um, so I, I, I think that this was always, always in the cards and for a team, look for a team as bad as the bears and they are truly, truly terrible. They're they are. They're bad. They're oh. real bad. And like they took longer to collapse from like their 2018 high on both offense and defense than yeah. I thought they would. But they they completed the post Vic Fangio bottom out in 2022. An awful, awful, awful roster. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're set for at least a two, three year rebuild. So if 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 they can parlay the number one pick overall into uh, you know, later first round picks, early second round picks, and they can stock up on like i don't know one one idea i had is viable starting receivers yes for the bears that would be that would be cool well it's another uh, reason they need draft picks is they did trade a second rounder for chase claypool chase claypool chase clay come on are you kidding that they, they, they cannot be like right now chase claypool is the number one receiver for that well i guess maybe yeah, Darnell Darnell Moody. Moody still but, but, but okay but neither of those guys both of those guys are at best number twos probably number threes those are both guys that have, who are are solid number twos on like a championship level team. They're probably number threes. Um, yeah. Need so, so the, you know, get, get some, get some receiver help, get some offensive line help. You know, uh, Justin Fields is constantly under siege. Um, and, and really, partly, you know, it's his fault. partly it's his fault. We must throw that in there. I feel like, I mean, but any, any, you know, any mobile, when you have a mobile quarterback, you know what you're getting there with, with it's true, uh, it's true. running, running into sacks. And, and like we saw that with Russell Wilson forever. You see that with Josh Allen, like, Oh, I'm letting a guy break me in half yet again. Oh, well, I know. Uh, I know. Yeah. So, I mean, if you just, if you just look at like, uh, like PFF grades, uh, overall grades from last year, you have like, you know, like the pass rush for the bears is, uh, uh, dead last. And, well, I thought uh, you were saying they're past blocking too. Or no offense, I mean, I love my local grocery store. They have grocery stockers on their offensive line. Right. No, nothing against grocery workers, by the way. No. Yeah. No. So, so I mean, but but their 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 defense was was you know an abomination. Twenty uh, sixth in coverage grade last year. So you know maybe maybe using some of that uh, to uh, uh, to to bolster bolster the defense. Thirty uh, second, dead last in receiving grade, and and that, and that makes sense. Look. When you have Byron Pringle out there running running 100 percent of routes at, at some point during the season, that's not good. It's not good. Put some respect on Equiminius St. Brown's name, Denny. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. yeah, the Bears, they they need they're just the classic. There's a reason they have the number one pick. I mean, they should have the number two, but Lovey Smith won't go there. Um, they yeah. should have, but they, they need to stockpile as many picks as humanly possible. They, they are a textbook. This isn't like a fluke number one pick. This is they they earn this number one pick the hard way, yes. and they need to stockpile as many picks as possible. Absolutely, and and you know as for the teams that would vie for for that pick, I guess the Texans would be near the top, so they can move one spot ahead and and get Bryce Young probably, or maybe C.J. Stroud, but probably Bryce Young. Bryce Young um, is supposedly only five, five foot ten. Um, that's supposedly the bombshell coming I out know, of the combine this week. Yeah. 
Um, he's but, uh, he's he, you know, he's going to stand on his tippy toes and he's going to eat lots of McDonald's over the next uh, yes. few, few weeks. Because <laughs> uh, he's he's not he's not going to be at the combine or he's not going to uh, do the. He's not going to participate. Yeah, what people have pointed out that he there's no way he can participate because in addition to his height, he's <clears throat> desperately needed to get his weight up. So he's going to be showing up just like I'm always rocked up 210 pounds. Uh, but coincidentally, I can't do any of the workouts this week because he'll be too too heavy to do the workouts, but he can't show up too light and appear to not be durable at the NFL level. So he's really kind of walking a tightrope as he heads into our glorious combine. I, I, I would I would be I am a little more hesitant to like to say like, oh, huge red flag. And I know this is a completely different position but we did this with Devonte smith at least i did this with Devonte smith where it's too skinny you know it's it, it j- just can't can't work and you know look where he's a top what top 15 receiver in the nfl you do this all the time with kyler murray in the height though um well but there's a difference between kyler murray's height and bryce young's height i think kyler's taller than bryce no. young i mean yeah. not, no but but if we're if we're acknowledging reality He's definitely thicker than Bryce Young. Kyler is big and strong. Bryce Young, Bryce Young looks five foot ten. To me. Kyler Murray's like five eight. No, he's not. No, he's, he's no. Like I mean, like, like really, like if we're actually being like, oh, remember Ben Roethlisberger was listed as like two forty when he was clearly three forty. Yeah, come on, like, man. come on, come on. Ben, ben <laughs> we can't big. trust these. <laughs> ben played big. Ben played big. Uh, we were talking about grocery workers, by the way. Do you think you'd be strong enough to push in all those carts, Denny? No, not no. I know this for a fact. I can neither push in the carts nor pull out the carts. And you should see me. I, I go like totally he man on the <laughs> carts. Uh, I love like ripping a cart out of a big old cart scrum. Uh, I do love. And I you know, don't. I love jamming them in there too. I don't want to break the carts, but I love so, jamming them in there. I, I no. Okay, I've embarrassed myself many times as recently as like two weeks ago, where I've gone in and I'm like I'm like hyped. I'm like I don't care. I'm grabbing the first card I see in the scrum and I'm pulling it as hard as I can. And it, it's coming out no matter what. And I do it. And the whole line of carts comes with me. You know? <laughs> and you and, and I'm like, oh, oh, geez. Oh my God. Like, you know, I almost like knock over an 85 year old woman behind me. And, <laughs> you know, it was embarrassing. Strain your rotator cuff real quick. Some of the trade ups I mean, the Falcons could trade up. I guess maybe the Saints could. Saints probably don't have enough ammunition to get to number one. No, no way. I'd say the Falcons could be. The Lions could be. The Colts are definitely going to be one of the prime suspects. Producer Adam points out. Uh, <clears throat> man, yeah. I think the Colts and Falcons, maybe the Panthers. Um, I mean, the Texans are the best position. The Texans, it'll be so annoying for them to have to pay that premium to move up literally one spot. But I mean, if they want Bryce Young they're gonna have to do it i mean i feel like the titans could be a dark horse um there's some interesting teams in here but I, I, I fact, someone's with, someone's trading for it yeah i agree with producer adam uh with uh saying the colts i i would put the <clears throat> the odds on that the, the colts have um you know the picks uh you know the players perhaps to to entice the uh, you know, the bears into that, but poor, te- poor Texans, man, they came so close to having the first pick and nothing. And nothing. They absolutely botched it. You very rare that you will see a botch job quite that bad, but it's, it's going to be, it's pretty fascinating story. And by the way, if you're itching for more draft talk, our sports betting show bet the edge also broke down who could go first overall in the draft. Uh, they do this kind of stuff all the time. You can listen to it wherever you get your pods, or check it out on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. Really, really smart guys over on Bet the Edge. Yeah. And yeah, it's going to be the number one overall pick market's always fascinating. But I think this year it's like particularly wide open. And I still think, I don't think the league is quite settled on Bryce Young as the number one overall pick, right. mostly because of the spindly side. I mean, again, I, I, I swear I'm not five, nine, I'm a real 5'10. You just can't really probably be my size and be an NFL number one overall quarterback. I don't know, it's, it's tough out there. Well, I think you're selling yourself short. Is, you, is we we debate about this. You always claim I'm taller. Uh, I have to, I have to beg, beg and plead with you that I'm not as tall as you think. One, um, one day I'm coming to Missouri and we are standing back to back and people will be like, Oh yeah, Pat's two and a half inches taller than Benny. Look at that. <laughs> Maybe every kid I add an inch just because they need more dad strength with every yes. kid we bring into this. To big, pull those Big, beautiful, crazy world, mm-hmm. Denny. Uh, ESPN's Mike Reese 
has reported that Jacoby Myers, quote, might project to get a contract near what Christian Kirk got last offseason. That, of course, would create major waves, major lulls, major L-A-F-F-S. Yeah. We love our laughs. Uh, does this seem crazy to you? Um, is Jacoby Myers the next Christian Kirk, Denny? You know, I, I think Jim, Jacoby Myers works as like a pretty solid number two on a on a on a decent off not even a good offense but like a, a, a decent offense his his efficiency definitely uh took a jump last year uh and you know he's he's a he's a zone buster like he you know gets open in the soft spots he doesn't do a whole lot after the catch and kind of you know you know what you're getting with jacoby meyer uh <clears throat> i i yeah, M- myers denny come on put myers some respect on i know i always mess that up put some respect I, on that ass I always, I always know, I know it's Myers, and yet I say Myers. His last Myers. name with S's or not S's, I, I'm a Missoula. I'm Chase Daniel, you know, a legendary quarterback. He's yeah. been called Chase Daniels his entire life. Um, you, Chase you, know what, you know what messes me up is Urban Meyer. Yeah. With, with, with yeah. Jacoby Meyer. I'm like, oh, okay, so everybody's just Meyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so Sorry uh, to disrupt your train of thought for literally. No, hours. and I apologize to Jacoby. I know he's a big listener. Of the show, but uh, um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, because there are not many great free agent options on the market uh, and there are teams with a lot of money to spend, I think that Jehovah Myers is going to get a ludic- ludicrously large contract uh, and people are going to laugh. But, you know, it, you, I, I'm, I'm done laughing at, at teams after the Christian Kirk thing because Christian Kirk actually turned out to be a pretty good signing. Overpaid, maybe. But it turned out to be Christian I'm, Kirk, is how I'd put it. I mean, I'm happy. It's like, I'm happy. They, they paid. They got what they paid for. Him. I'll say that. Like, I, I do. I do think in the analytics community, I think that we need to pump the brakes a little bit on saying, "Oh my God, this team overpaid." Per my formula. This over team, this team gave uh, Christian Kirk six and a half million more dollars than he deserved. No, just just go with it. Sometimes you just got to go with. You can't mm-hmm. always look like a robot, you know. And you can't and well, too with free agency. I think it finally went too far the other direction where it just became such an article of faith. Like, well, good teams don't spend money in free agency. The yes. people just, like weren't spending enough money, and there's been teams now who pretty successfully like like it, it used to be like just a given that if you had the best free agent class, you were just going to be bad because only bad teams were spending that kind of money in free agency mm-hmm. that has been turned on its head a lot in recent years. And spending in free agency is not necessarily a bad thing now. And they're almost taking, taking advantage of a market inefficiency of teams just being afraid. You know, in the NFL, it's weird. You probably like, because you know the truly great players don't reach the open market, so I'm sure teams are kind of leery about mm-hmm. you know, why why was Christian Kirk allowed to reach the open market. Um, yeah, you well, I, I, and I will say Jacoby Myers in what was inarguably uh, a horrific, almost, you know, hilariously bad Patriots offense was 22nd in yards per route run among all receivers last year. Wow. You know, I mean, well, not, not that. bad, you know, imagine what he could have done with a, you know, with a, with a viable in a viable offense and I'm not even, not even a good, I'm thinking he like, might have, uh, he might've scored three touchdowns. Didn't I, I think like the dolphins offense. Okay. Right. And, and the, forget, forget, forget touchdowns. I don't want to talk about touchdowns, but um, you know, yards per route run is a, is a good indicator of efficiency. 22nd. That's not bad. Denny, you were saying some things off air about Juju Smith Schuster. I won't repeat them on this podcast, but <laughs> imagine Jacoby Myers on the Chiefs. Like, uh, man, that would have been awesome. He would. Okay, but no, I'm not being sarcastic. Actually, I'm saying like, yeah, yeah, yeah like imagine Jacoby Myers is way better than Juju. All right, way probably. better. He probably is. Yeah. Ask AJ Brown. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Ask AJ Brown. I would like to get his AJ Brown's been on kind of a heater. Remember, like four or five years ago when. You could just name any current NFL player to Jalen Ramsey. He'd be like, sucks. He'd be like, you name another one, sucks, 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 awful, the worst, sucks. So that's kind of what A.J. Brown has been in lately. And yeah, you you're, you're talking about when when they asked uh, Jalen Ramsey about like Matt Stafford and others. Who was the one he really uh, – um, someone he ended up being right on. I can't remember. He, he was really out in front on a young quarterback being horrible. Was it Was it golf? It was, I think it was maybe Trubisky. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't remember. Anyways, they were all bad. None of them ended up good. Speaking of not ending up good, Denny, you do not like the Bucks' 2023 prospects oh on offense. God. We think we're headed for a total fantasy free fall. 
They, no team has ever been down worse than talking up Kyle Trask as the Bucks are currently doing. Uh, they're talking about committing to the run when they had the league's worst run game in 2022. And this was with the greatest quarterback of all time occupying the defense's attention. They could not take advantage of any of those soft fronts. Oh, or is Mike Evans getting up there? Chris Godwin never seemed like he was all the way back from his knee injury last year. Are we looking at like a total fallout zone for the Bucks so- offense in 2023? I guess the Bucks have reached the point where there's so, there's so little expectation for them. It reminds me of the way we looked at the Seahawks roster after the Russell Wilson trade, where like everybody is for fantasy purposes is dead here. You know, Metcalf, Lockett, the running backs, Geno, everybody. So maybe the play is for best ball purposes. The play is to lean into the Bucks. I don't know. Oh, I mean, it's a little early. I feel like we normally get into the True Galaxy brains around April or May. You're already I, saying there's no difference between good and bad things on February 27th. Well, look, when you're in a massive field of best ball drafters, <laughs> there is no difference between good and bad things. That actually is true. Um, <laughs> <There's> <laughs> not. Yeah. Well, the difference is the difference is that the bad things end up winning you money and the good things don't. But uh, yeah, so you have uh, Todd Bowles saying, telling the Tampa Bay Times this weekend that uh, he hired new offensive coordinator Dave Canales. From the Seattle Seahawks. Um, from the Seahawks to uh, pretty much establish it, you know, to to uh, do have a run first offense, and and uh, I guess that's to be expected if you're if you possibly have Kyle Trask under center for Week One. I, I guess you're not going to air it out with Kyle Trask, and I get that. I will say that uh, Rashad White, and I've said this, and it upsets you, I think, a little bit, but Rashad White was very, very bad okay. as a rookie. Yeah. Uh, and Leonard, Leonard Fournette is probably going to be released uh, because he's oldish and uh, making a lot of money. He's so, now gets blown out in the wild card round, Lenny. Yeah, <laughs> which doesn't have the same ring as Lombardi, Lenny. But we're we're going with it. It's actually the, the style that we're using on NBC Sports. Yeah, that's actually Associated Press style, by the way. Yeah, um, and that's uh, how you identify, the first reference. That's how you identify him. And I know Rashad White was a was an exciting prospect, and maybe it was the offensive line. I I the, the offensive line for the Bucks very bad at run blocking, per the numbers. So you know maybe maybe that was it. But wow, I I do not I do not get excited about Rashad White at all. You do not get excited, but it sounds like you're considering Kyle Trask quote builds in your best <laughs> ball in your best <laughs> ball <laughs> leagues. Is this, is this true, Danny? <laughs> What are the Kyle Trask builds right now? Uh, Look, the Kyle Trask build is <laughs> is you get you get you get Trask. You get Kate Godwin. Otten. If, if if you take Kyle Trask oh. and don't get Kate Otten, you might as well just leave the league. I mean, right? No, you you've completely you know missed missed the thesis of the play if yeah. if you don't get Kate Otten because Kate Otten is going to be the recipient of 115 short receptions this year from Kyle Trask, who has been described, by the way, as a point guard. And I think we all know what that means. It means a guy who cannot throw downfield and who will just dish off in the short field. Yeah, you do not want your NFL quarterbacks playing point guard. No, no, no. It's a real, it's a, it's a huge insult. It's a huge (laughs) insult. Speaking of huge insults, Denny's article, we're going to talk about it next. No, it's really good. Five receivers who quietly dominated in 2022. We'll be right back to talk about it. Spring training is upon us, and that means only one thing. It is draft season. Get the Roto World Baseball Draft Guide today and get all player profiles, rankings, and projections you need to hit your draft out of the park. Go to NBCSportsEdge.com slash draft guide to get your guide now. And don't forget, Download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It is available in your app store today. I didn't gotta gotta get that Roto World. There's we're, we're doing a, a show that I will be taking part in next week. A live yeah. draft. I'll yeah. be drafting with DJ Short and company. It's gonna be a really good time. I believe maybe 11 a.m. Eastern next Tuesday. I could be. Totally getting that wrong, though. Um, okay. But we're doing a draft. Yeah, 11 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, March 7th, I believe. What if, is the 7th, 6th? Uh, anyway, the first Tuesday in March, we are doing a live draft at 11 a.m. Eastern on Road to World. And uh, um, so you're telling me I'm not, I'm not invited? You are not invited, no. Okay. Uh, you're not invited. I'll just have to lead thoughts another way. Yeah, you will. Um, I'm sure there's some live golf live drafts. Going oh, on. oh, very funny. Um, 
Yeah, no, so check it out. It's going to be a really good time. Uh, your article, though, you talk about five receivers who had bigger 2022s than the public yeah. may realize, especially if you didn't have them on your fantasy team. You probably weren't really paying attention to Garrett Wilson. You probably tuned out DJ Moore three years ago. I mean, no one's paying attention to what Jerry Judy did in 2022, Denny. But let's go through your article, just player by player. Talk about some players who quietly dominated in 2022. Who yeah. do you want to begin with? We'll start with Chris Olave, who is a Saints receiver, for those unfamiliar. Uh, he was, you know, Madden, Maddenly, Maddenly, how do you say it? Madden, Madden, Madden and, oh my God. <laughs> Maddeningly. That's it's a way. Word, that's a word that you write. You don't say it, that word. It's way easier to spell. Anyway, yeah. he, was, he was inconsistent, and he ended up as outside the top 24 fantasy receivers. So if you drafted him, you were probably pretty frustrated. But I'm here to tell you not to give up hope uh, entirely, really, because – uh, he was, as the headline says, quietly dominant in the New Orleans offense last year. So the Saints had four games, only four, in which they were over their expected pass rate, Matt. Only wow. four. That actually and, is stunning. Uh, and uh, in all four of those games, uh, you know who had had a really had really nice numbers. It was all about really lack of vo- or volume or lack of lack thereof for uh, for Chris Olave. Um, he posted a higher yards per route run <clears throat> uh, than everybody except for six wideouts, and all of them are in the elite tier. Elite tier. We're talking Devonte Adams, Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, things of that guys of that nature. Uh, so uh, uh, Olave, and you can you can read. You know, I'm not going to bore you guys with the numbers right now, but you can read through the numbers and see that you know by every indication he is a guy who commands both targets and air yards and. When you combine those two things, it tends to work out. Now, I know dynasty folks and, you know, more intense like best ballers are saying, of course, Chris Olave, of course. But there, I think I think there, there's a fair um, number of, of, you know, committed, avid fantasy players who look at Chris Olave's rookie uh, outcome and say, eh, not for me. Yeah, I think, I mean, to those people who are probably frustrated with the lack of consistency, like you said, but... I mean, even despite the very, very traditional box score, I mean, 120 targets, over a thousand yards, only played 15 games. I mean, he, a guy who was clearly yeah. the restrictor plate was on and it was not his choice. Just one of the least imaginative offenses in the NFL. I mean, things can always get worse, but it's hard to see how they'll be worse than Andy Dalton under center for the saints. And Alave, basically everything about it was that he was like a screaming by basically in dynasty. And someone I think that, we can remain very, very, very excited about. I mean, redraft 2023, we'll have to see who the quarterback is. Because, I mean, Dennis Allen, he's a very conservative coach. Um, we're going to need a, a pretty – we're going to need a quarterback upgrade. It can't be Andy Dalton again. No, but, um, and, and and that that's the one caveat here is that nobody – there will be no changes to this team except for maybe the quarterback. And that's not even a guarantee. So I, I do. The quarterback I do will be changed. I feel safe in saying the Saints will have a different starting quarterback. Um, let's just hope that it's not worse than Andy Dalton. There's a non-zero percent chance of someone worse than Andy right, Dalton. Right, right. So, I mean, this is a very stuck-in-the-mud franchise, as I wrote in the piece. Like, it, it, I just I, – there was there will be no systemic changes. I don't understand that is true. How, how Dennis Allen has his job. I don't understand how he's not going to completely overhaul the offense, uh, which was terrible. And their defense, the, the the shame of it is the defense is good, pretty good. They 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 could have a decent team if they would overall overhaul the offense. But Olave really things couldn't have gone worse for him, no. and he finished his wide receiver twenty five. Yeah, so we we love Chris Olave going forward in the rest of the career. Uh, Denny Drake London, I'm yeah. just going to pick the second player for you, a guy who did close the season strong. Where, I mean, all he needed was a quarterback upgrade, and it was barely an upgrade. I mean, our, not an upgrade for the overall package. Desmond Ritter did seem to throw a little more than Marcus Mariota, and when he did throw, it was to Drake London. Drake London just seemed like a born targets commander and the, yeah. the least pass-heavy offense in the entire league. How did Drake London quietly dominate in 2020? Yeah, so the Falcons, as, as anybody knows who, who listened to our show throughout the season, were the most stubbornly run-heavy offense in recent history, really, uh, uh, 18% below their expected pass rate, which is just really hard to hard to wrap your head around. But, you know, uh, anytime a, a rookie like Drake London commands 30% of the team's targets, you you pay you pay attention. Now, you know, in the way of like raw uh, volume, it doesn't come out to much. It's 119 targets, which uh, ranked um, 
20th in, in the league last year. And you have a big uh, disparity in the number of targets he was seeing before Kyle Pitts went down to injury and after. Um, he was seeing 8.5 eight and a half targets per game with Pitts out of the lineup. That was up from six targets per game with, with Pitts in the lineup. So with Pitts returning next year, presumably at full health at the start of the season, uh, I, I don't know if you can like project uh, like massive efficiency, uh, you know, turning into huge, you know, huge production, uh, very productive year, but Drake London, I, I think will be underdrafted. And I know, look, I know if you're in a savvy league, Drake London's not getting past anybody. I know that, but but uh, him and Chris Olave strike me as guys who 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 will be largely underdrafted. He does. And so last week, I did publish an article, and I took the nine teams I thought were most likely to have new starting quarterbacks in 2023, and just looked at where that starting quarterback could make the biggest immediate difference. And I wasn't really thinking about the Falcons when I went into the article. But when I actually started writing the article, I think the Falcons are one of the two or three teams like most primed to like, really benefit from a new quarterback. I mean, they were a lot better in 2022 than they were in 2021. One of the only four or five teams I think that have positive DVOA or on, in the run game. I think they had a, yeah. an amazing yeah. rushing attack. It's just waiting to be paired. I mean, it's always going to be more conservative than we like, but it's a rushing attack just dying to be paired with a more viable yes. passing attack where it could be a really dangerous offense in a division that's totally up for grabs where all four teams are changing quarterbacks. Kind of shocking. I, I, it's hard to think of other times that has happened. Well, um, yeah, I mean, and I'm not sorry to interrupt you, but I, I, I meant to, to interrupt, uh, interrupt to, to mention this, <laughs> to mention the stat, which is the after in the post Kyle Pitts injury uh, game. So we're talking about, about two months of Atlanta Falcons football, which everybody loves. Uh, we do. We love nobody. Route. Nobody. No receiver. No tight end. No wet. No but. No anybody had a higher yards per route run than Drake London. And mm-hmm. I, I, as listen, as the only receiver that anybody had to cover in that offense, like everybody knew the ball is going to be funneled to Drake London when the Falcons finally drop back and pass the ball. Knowing that they still really couldn't stop him, and that yards per route run leading the league shows shows as much. He's just a guy who knows how to use his massive frame. Like he's already got like NFL movement down, yeah. And he's just a quarterback away from exploding. And yeah, Drake London is someone I'll be very, very. I mean, depending on who the quarterback, is, they cannot go into the season with Desmond Ritter. And the Falcons are crazy enough that I could see them doing something like that, but they cannot go into the season with Desmond Ritter. Um, please get Drake London a better quarterback. Denny, who is third on your list of players, who, receivers who quietly dominated in 2022? Yeah, we have uh, Garrett Wilson, who, you know, no one will be shot. I don't know if he quite, he's the O'Roy, Denny. He's the he O'Roy. He's the, you ever heard of the O'Roy, the offensive no. rookie of oh, the O'Roy. year? Oh, okay. Yeah, quietly uh, quietly dominated and got the offensive rookie of the year. Uh, you're fine. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Well, you can finish up the podcast. But, <laughs> please, no, uh, please, please continue. It, it, it's, I think it is hard to separate Wilson from his quarterback play. Uh, that he has to suffer through with Joe Flacco, Zach Wilson, and, and even Mike White, who wasn't good. Sorry. Someone is forgetting Chris Strebler, too. Um, someone didn't watch enough Jets football, and it shows. Look, someone, me, namely me, wants Chris Strebler to start in the NFL. So I, I, I never is, forget. Do you have an Amazon subscription today? Just be straight. Just be honest. Because that, yeah, that happened do. on Thursday Night Football. Um, just yeah, making I, sure you're watching. Uh, excuse me. I had Chris Trevler in the captain spot oh in a life. God. Hey, that's right. You did. Oh my God. And he God. wasn't even, he wasn't even playing. <laughs> he wasn't even starting. <laughs> no, I forgot about that. And I, and I, and I won no money. So it, he, it paid he didn't off. win any money, but it was a big brain decision that could have been amazing. It was a lot. Uh, but Garrett player. Wilson, sorry, continue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, he finished his rookie year 16th in wide out target share. Uh, you know, thir- took in thirty percent of the the Jets' air yards, which is fine. Not not quite, not nearly as dominant as Chris Olave and Drake London, but it'll do. Um, and uh, I, I I think that I think there's a chance he gets a little underdrafted just because of the quarterback situation. I guess it depends. Like, hey, you know what? Derek Carr is under center, and I know you know you're not you're not a big Derek Carr guy, I, as I understand it. I will say I've that their car is the whole car family for their years. car is a, a you know a, a melding of Joe Montana and prime Dan Marino compared to Zach Wilson. So yes. I, I I would be I would be bullish on Garrett Garrett Wilson, but I I do think that he will be drafted appropriately either way. 
Derek Carr usually feeds his best weapons too. He is one of the better quarterbacks that like he will feed his guys. And I mean, Garrett Wilson, the Jets were absurdly pass heavy. So these numbers are kind of inflated, but you know, when a rookie comes in and draws 147 targets, that's yeah. like, that's like, yeah. wow. Like the, this, they love the player. And we know like target commanding is a skill. Yeah. Again, they had a, a trillion pass attempts despite being awful at the pass. But Garrett Wilson has commanded so many targets as a rookie. I mean, he he is someone too where you have to. You were probably you were probably disappointed if you had him in fantasy because it did not translate four touchdowns. I mean, it just didn't translate to fantasy. Yeah. Uh, but you cannot be scarred by the Zach Wilson experience, by the Joe Flacco experience, and yeah, should remain extremely bullish on Garrett Wilson for twenty twenty three. I mean, Wilson. I think I think it's I think it's Garrett Wilson guys like Garrett Wilson who make an early round running back approach viable like because you you can get him as your wide receiver one and he can be a wide receiver one in fantasy with with the right environment that's that's, um, a, that's a really interesting point i'm sure something will legislate all off season yeah. who's next all right uh dj moore and i'll just be quick with this dj yeah. moore was uh, dj moore we've been hearing this denny since i know uh, but he's never he's never you ever heard of jfk either. we've been hearing it since he was the prezi uh, right i i understand i understand and and he's headed into his age 26 season which is amazing by the way that he's not 36 and i thought he was really amazing um and he's never had a good quarterback so we're hoping frank I Reich never had a good season one quarter i'll break it could be last first off i've had dj Moore every year of his career. i'm i'm like as much of a dj Moore dead ender as there is in existence i know and, it, and, and i it, agree that he's still just waiting to go off and it stinks. It stinks being a dead ender, right? It hurts. Um, so here, here's some some dominating numbers here in an in an article about domination over the season's final two months. Moore took in sixty percent of the Panthers' air yards, which is just really hard to imagine. Really. Staggering. Uh, really staggering. He, he was during that stretch during that two month stretch. He was top ten in yards per route run. Uh, he had twenty eight percent target share over over that stretch. So. I mean, like a guy, we're looking for guys who, who dominate air yards, target share. That's what you have, with DJ Moore. Frank Reich is a good, great hire, putting together a good offensive staff. I think this, guys, I'm telling you, this time it counts. This time it, it counts, count. with DJ Moore. I will say that a totally, maybe totally fluky thing. I do feel like receivers never really got their numbers under Frank Reich in Indianapolis. Like again, that, that's not really, that's not like a sticky statistic yeah. at all. Yeah. But like. That was a strange thing with the Frank Reich offense. And and I might be misremembering too. I'm sure someone probably did get their numbers. I mean, but... Pittman became something of like a target funnel. <laughs> he um, did. When, when the when the offense was operational. Yeah. I, I just think I, the, the com- comparison I've made for years on DJ Moore, I just feel like he is like the next Stefan Diggs if ever someone would let him be. Yeah. yeah. He can just do damage at every level of the field. And it's just so technically proficient. But I mean, they got to get a quarterback. Got to get a quarterback. Absolutely. Who, who Who's the last receiver on your list, Denny Carter? Yeah, we're wrapping it up with Jerry Judy, uh, for whom I don't have much fantasy interest generally. Uh, but after What's the deal? Like, Jerry Judy, everyone's like, stop. Everyone's moved on from Jerry Judy. I mean, because it's it's bleak. It's It's been bleak for Jerry Judy. The injuries, the fact that he's like behind Cortland Sutton in the pecking order for, for parts of the last couple – well, yeah, a couple of years, I guess – Anyway, yeah, but he's he finished last season really strong. He had um uh, he was further over his expected fantasy points than any receiver in the league over the f- season's final 6 weeks and it's not even close. A huge huge margin there. Uh over those final 6 weeks he commanded 30% of Den- Denver's air yards, uh the 14th most among wideouts. So we're talking like CD Lamb, DeAndre Hopkins range. Um he also and I and I I found this little nugget interesting because it actually uh, goes hand in hand with how he was evaluated coming out uh, in, in, you know, coming out of college into the NFL. Um, <clears throat> he ate up man coverage in 2022, posting the highest yards per route run in the six highest yards after the catch per reception against man coverage. In other words, he was really good when teams played man coverage against him. He was what we might call a man eater. Yeah. <laughs> and he, I feel like he fits the Sean Payton mold where, I mean, Cortland Sutton too. Something Cortland Sutton has not been physically right since no. he tore up his knee. Just has not been the same. And he's one of those guys who didn't have very far to fall because he always re- he relied on like winning in tight spaces, like kind of winning hand fights. Cortland Sutton was a guy who 
he was already like kind of relying on like technical prowess. So like couldn't lose much of his physicality. And he so far has coming off his knee injury. Whereas Jerry Judy too, like he's an explosive guy, but like he's a guy who, 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 who's best like underneath, like a really, really good route runner. Someone who can be very explosive underneath and after the catch, like you said, something that's always been a really big part of the Sean Payton offense. Yeah. Like he could be someone kind of left for dead and fantasy who could just go nuts in 2023 who could who could go up like several levels and people might just not people might be prepared for it by the summer because we, we have so many months of narrative building and stuff but jerry judy could be someone that, like people aren't prepared for like like how many tiers he's going to jump yeah. in 2023 right i i i do think i mean without without some like real industry-wide hype for jerry judy i think that he will be a nice a nice little value and another guy who might make it possible to go in on a running back or two uh, early in the draft. Hmm, so Denny, early running back, I also. I, I, did, I, did. I, I didn't say it was right or that I was doing it. But talking about this a lot. But if if that's your comfort level with fantasy football. You're expecting a brand switch, it seems like. And Jerry Judy, too, I guess he fits the Sean Payton offense. I guess does anyone fit the Russell Wilson offense? Russell Wilson never been known as a dinker and dunker. And no, he's going to have to no. get on the same page with Sean Payton if he wants to unlock Jerry Judy. And I can't tell. Does Sean Payton seem like he likes Russell Wilson? When I hear Sean Payton talk, it seems like Russell Wilson wasn't one of the reasons he took the job. No, like, it doesn't. It really which doesn't. is very concerning because why else would you take this job? But I mean, I guess the piles and piles and piles of money. <laughs> right. I, I do. I do. I do think that that played a factor. I think compensation played a factor. Um, but hey, look at Russell Wilson has won as Sean Payton as his head coach for years now. Uh, really? Uh, really? Well, the I, athletic. Well, Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so he fight he got it, and he's going to be part of the team now. He's going to be in the locker room sometimes, which he's is going to quote can do. call the correct audibles. Right. He's not going to get delay of uh, game penalties called on him because he's giving motivational speeches. In the <laughs> you, know? And, 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 you know, it's all going to fall in line. I think. Yeah, filming a subway commercial in the huddle. I mean, don't get me wrong. I thought it was a nice stunt, but uh, it's why they lost the game. <laughs> why they lost that game so <laughs> interesting where did you read he wanted sean payton that's uh, yeah uh, really... the athletic had a uh, in the middle of your um you know uh child uh, situation your baby situation uh the athletic had a an explosive piece on russell wilson's catastrophic first year in denver really uh, i actually that is something that flew under the radar that's you yeah. talk about catnip uh, and his uh yeah, yeah his, his right exit now. so here, here are the major takeaways pat um he demanded that both uh, Pete Carroll and John Schneider be fired. Uh, and that precipitated his trade to Denver. Uh, he then, uh, the, the other things are he has, uh, you knew he had an office on the second floor, I think. I think uh, I did know that he had a headquarters, office. but he was never in the locker room. Uh, and then the, the motivational speech in the huddle was an actual thing. I'm not making it. Wait, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> that was just a joke. No, it, was it wasn't a joke. Very believable joke, but um, wow. Yeah, that guy. Um, so, so they would they would get they would get the play call in with 25 seconds to go on the on the game on the play clock, right? Uh, the, the, according to the athletic, and the coaches would be looking at each other. Why, why are they still in the huddle? Why are they still in the huddle? And uh, some unnamed player said it's because Russell wouldn't stop talking. Oh my gosh, uh, he's just giving a podcast interview in the huddle. Um, I mean, I think he was giving you know six ways to wealth. Yeah, I know, the grind set. You sleep 90 minutes. Um, <laughs> You download Mark Wahlberg's app. That is not an advertisement. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so probably a good time to end the show if I'm making jokes about Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, um, probably. Pretty good for February 27th and pretty good for – I hate to play in the cliche, but, yeah, I'm not sleeping very much right now. I think you did I think you did great for a sleep-deprived dad. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, And shouts to, to baby Alice as she learns what is day and what is night. <laughs> So we're all we're all thinking of you, Alice. There. Um, so for for Denny Carter, for Alice Darty, I'm Patrick Darty. Thank you for listening. We'll be back later this week. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.